I'm Thomas Hahn. I do research in ecological economics. I am Hannah. I am studying business administration with a major in finance and uh, yeah, will graduate this spring. Okay. Um, what do you know about their task and what, what does it mean for you? Well, I always been inspired by and I used a lot of my time to this third task. So if um, research is the first first task and education is the second, then um, discussing these things with society abroad is uh, the third task. It is as important as the other two tasks. Yeah. When you are employed by the state as researchers, you have a unique uh, freedom to express your your opinion. And uh, you have a prestige because people don't say that you are uh, belong to this and this lobby group or belong to this trade union or industry. You're supposed to be free. Of course, as researchers, you also have your interest, your political interest, your interest in society, in environment or people or whatever. So we are not more neutral than anyone else when it comes to our interest. But if we have something to say and we have knowledge about these issues, then I think we have a duty. Do you think it's important that everyone, uh, even though you you read economy, what climate change is due to, what it's about the planetary boundaries, about yeah. why we have climate change, even though it doesn't, it's not directly connected to what, for yeah. example, I want to work yeah. with? I, when I was a student, uh, some people were interested in computers, some were not. I was not interested in computers. Um, now I wish I would have been a little bit more interested because then it wouldn't take so long time to learn uh, all these things. But now I'm, ex- I'm an expert. I know Word and Excel and Internet. I, I, can, I can Google and so on. And that kind of expertise is not very um, impressive, of course. Uh, you know much more than I do. But, but that kind of no- no- knowledge will be compulsory in just five or ten years. So you will all be climate experts whether you want it or not because it's a part of everyday life. We have to understand what is a carbon budget, um, what is the total emissions global, and w- what is what technology is um, better for environment, and what is a uh, carbon return on investment. We talk about return on investment, but also carbon return on investment. If we invest in wind power that consumes carbon dioxide, it, it emits carbon dioxide. But then during the lifetime of a wind power plant, it will also save carbon dioxide. Um, so what is a carbon return on investment? Those will be the the standard things for you as a business administration if you if you work in different investments and so on yeah. that that you will know uh, whether you like it or not. Yeah. You don't have to be interested, but you have to know it yeah. just like computers. Yeah. You lead Fairtrans, it's called it, this yes. research project. Do you want to explain a little bit more about what's what it's about and this research call was about collaboration with civil society organizations. And um, our organizations have four or five million members in Sweden. So we represent the people. And if we can make sure that we say that we don't want uh, lower prices of petrol and gas and, and diesel, but we want actually even higher prices. We put high tax on these things, but then use the revenues and give it back to the people. And especially the people on the countryside where they are on a good public transport or especially the people who are low income, who can't afford these high petrol prices. So they get fully compensated, okay. overcompensated. So there are ways that we can discuss this in a much more intelligent way, because now when we see how populist movements say, that, oh, we should reduce the price on petrol and diesel, yeah. and they, they claim they have the support of people. So if we can organize, we can have a learned conversation together with civil society, and we can get the support from five million members. We think civil society should be the, the leaders, that they should take the lead in this policy development. Today it is big business who takes the lead, and it's good because they are focused on, on technology, but they totally forget about fairness. And then this might not work. So people might pro- protest, and then governments will not do this transformation because they don't feel the support of the people. Mm. It's really interesting and it's really relevant for for a third task as well. Yeah, so that's actually, now I get get research money, I get the first task money to do the third task. If you look at how we measure economy today, we often use 
GDP and GDP benefits from increased market transactions, mm. which says that when we uh, buy more and consume more and uh, an increased production benefits GDP. Yeah. But since this disagree with a sustainable economy that, that should have respect for ecological capacity, um, could we still use GDP or is there any like complement to GDP mm. or should we just stop using it? The economic development is very much built on material. So when people get higher salaries, we might use some of the money for um, theater and preventive health care and something that is very low carbon footprint. But then we also build a new kitchen or we build a new house or a uh, summer house or a car. So we also use the material footprint is increasing all the time. So it is a problem. If we're still striving for GDP increase, that is a problem. And we also see there's a decoupling between well-being or life quality, um, which is stagnating a bit. Um, sometimes it's going down because of um, psychological illness. And um, um, so there's a decoupling. So GDP is continuing to increase, but life quality is actually stagnating. So if we instead focus on what's important for people's well-being, what's important for the life quality, then we see that, of course, some things we need, we need food, we need shelter, we need clothes. So those things are market transactions. We, we, need, we need health and education, which is, well, market or public sector transaction. Mm -hmm. So some of this is, is material. But we also need to be feel safe and feel secure. And that's a matter of, of income, um, income inequality, which makes people feel less secure if income inequality is increasing. If, you, if you're not able to compete, then you can be outcompeted, and that's a terrible thing. You can be marginalized. Mm -hmm. So there are many other things that are important for human well-being that I think society should strive for. And then this model called the, the donut model or the donut economics, mm -hmm. which has been proposed by Kate Raworth, a British economist. It's a standard thing in ecological economics. It's not novel, but it's a very nice put. And then you can see that it's only two goals. It's the social goals and it's the ecological goals. There's no economic goals. So the social goals is to fulfill all this human well-being and the sustainable development goals, basically. Education and uh, electricity and democracy, and gender equity and so on. And we need resources. We need electricity for these things to, to, to get the, so the social goals. So you need a well-functioning economics. But economics is a tool, and that's very important. Economics is a tool, and market, econo market economy is a very useful tool for uh, making sure that people get what they want. But, mar but economics is not a goal. It's not a goal that we should maximize consumption or maximize production, because that does not make us happier. There are lots of research uh, showing that. Once you come to a certain GDP per capita, which all European countries have passed already, e even Romania and Bulgaria have passed that level, that threshold. Then further growth is not the thing. What we need is democracy, um, security, safety, um, and freedom, and leisure time, uh, meaningful lives, and good relations. And then all comes good nature, food, and water. Uh, that's what makes people happy. And uh, that depends on, on other reforms, uh, democracy, education, good health care for everyone, so people don't feel marginalized or being scared for being unemployed. All those things are bad for human well-being. Mm. So we can increase human well-being and, and uh, life quality can increase, even though GDP might stagnate. So what's your plan for the future with Fair Trends? Uh, is there any development about the program or uh, what's th what does yeah. the future hold? We have, um, we're have doing bottom-up um, co-production of knowledge and co-production of policies. So in our um, fear of change, um, if, if we can actually engage them in double-loop learning and triple-loop learning, so they're thinking about ah, what is the meaning of life? Is it to increase GDP even more? No, it's not really. Um, uh, so if, if they can reevaluate their understanding of what is the political goal and talk more about sustainability, then we have five million members 
who will support the position. And then for the first time, governments and, and parliaments will feel supported in actually doing more sustainability policies. Today, they don't have that support. Because as soon as prices go up on energy or petrol, there will be mass mobilization of, I, I sometimes call it the, the, the fake left. Because the fake left are those people who pretend to care about the poor people. Oh, look at these people. Oh, we, for, solid, for solidarity reasons, we cannot le- le- let them pay so much for the petrol. In reality, it's, it's men, middle-aged men in Stockholm who buy most petrol. And uh, you don't have to care about their well-being, having lower prices of petrol. And if you really care about poor people, then you can do, as we talked about before, you can increase taxes and then pay back the taxes to these people. Pay back all the, the revenues, the compensation. But we, we need higher prices for things that are bad for environment must be higher prices. That's a rule in economics. So we need more economics.